Welcome to episode 31 of the Film Inventories podcast. This is a bonus episode of sorts, um, which I'll talk about in just a moment. But firstly, I just wanted to take a moment to talk about Jonathan Rintzler, who passed away at the end of July 2021. Jonathan was a husband, a father, and to the many film fans around the world, a talented author of simply the best behind-the-scenes books. I first became aware of his work in the early 2000s and bought pretty much everything he wrote on the original trilogy, Star Wars films. Outside of Lucasfilm, he also continued to write books on Alien, Aliens and Planet of the Apes. He most recently wrote Howard Kazanjian, A Producer's Life, which is due for release this September in the US, October, I think, in the UK. I contacted Jonathan last year, inviting him to come on the podcast. Um, he replied saying yes, and we arranged a date. And then I heard back from him nearer that date, saying he'd had some bad news about his health and would have to postpone slightly. Um, despite what was going on in his life, he still wanted to continue to do the interview. Um, I, of course, said, don't worry, Jonathan, it's not a problem. You know, you take care of yourself. That's the priority. And he said, no, 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 I do want to talk. And in some way, I think it helped him talk about his work. It helped sort of distract him from the day-to-day -day of the treatment that he was having for his pancreatic cancer. I'll always be grateful to Jonathan for his work, his time, and his generosity. It was really great to see his fans pull together to donate his GoFundMe page to cover his medical bills within a day or two there, um, between us all, we raised $50,000. Um, any surplus was going to be donated to a charity of his family's choice. Sending my heartfelt condolences to all that knew Jonathan. He was a great guy. And we're the lucky ones. His legacy will live on in his wonderful writing. Thanks, Jonathan. Back to this episode, number 31. So when I finished speaking with Walter Murch for episode 30, he emailed me and asked if I was happy with what I'd got. I replied saying that I, of course, had many more questions for him, but I was aware of not wanting to take up too much of his time, adding that I'd regretted not talking to him about his directorial debut, Return to Oz. He quickly replied saying, let's chat again on Monday. I can give you about 45 minutes and I'll be happy to talk about Return to Oz. So that's exactly what we did. So here's the second part of my chat with film legend Walter Murch and I'll be back at the end for a bit more jabbering on. Walter, can you put into context the position that Disney were in, Disney was in in the early 1980s and what led them to approach an outsider, as it were? Uh, yeah, Disney had always been the most closed of studios. Uh, they were self-sufficient, rarely brought other filmmakers in, whereas, you know, the other Hollywood studios would constantly be being uh, trading uh, directors and actors and whatever. But I think in the 70, late 70s, there were two shocks to the system at Disney, which was Star Wars and The Black Stallion, both of which were made by us up in San Francisco. And I, I imagine that there was a conference among the executives at Disney saying, these are the kind of films we should be making. And there had been a crisis when Disney himself died in the late, in 66, I think. And they were, had been running kind of on autopilot for the last 15 years. And so they started reaching out to other people and somehow my name got into a basket and they plucked it up and I was called down to, to talk to them about doing a project for Disney, which uh, you know, uh, at the time was highly unlikely. So that was the, the general setup uh, that resulted ultimately in me directing Return to Oz. And what was your connection with the, uh, the Oz film and the Oz books? Um, where, where's your first kind of experience with those? My 
My mother had been born in what is now Sri Lanka. And uh, her parents were Canadian and they were there starting a teaching hospital in the northern part of what, what was then Ceylon. And the big thing for kids at that time around the turn of the century were the Oz books. It was just exactly like Harry Potter is today. Every year there was a new Oz book and you got the Oz book and waited for the next one. So that was her experience growing up. And when I was born, as soon as I was, as soon as she thought I was able to take on the, the Oz sensibility, she started reading those books to me and I loved them. And uh, the Ozma of Oz, the, one, of, one of the books that Return to Oz is started on was the first book that, I don't know, I think I was age five or something, that I sat down to, I'm going to read a grown-up book, meaning a book that had more words in it than pictures, uh, although I loved the pictures. So that was the, the, the ground. I, the, the, the Oz sensibility was deeply ingrained in our family because of the history and in me. And at the same time, uh, my son was born in 68, and we wa started watching Sesame Street uh, in the early 70s. And I, there was something about the Muppets that made me think this is kind of Ozian, the, the quality. It helped that Frank Oz was, was <laughs> one of the main puppeteers on it. So I went down to Disney to just be polite and have a meeting. And the, the executive, Tom Wilhite, said, well, what do you, what would you like to do that you think we would be interested in doing? And I plucked out the Oz book. So I said, a sequel to The Wizard of Oz. Oh, he said, we, we own the rights to all those books, which I had no <laughs> idea. And the discussion started from there. And they were, they, they, that, that copyright that they had bought or the, the rights uh, was gonna, were going to run out in five years or something. So they were very anxious to get something going. And after that, one thing led to another. Uh, Gil Dennis and I wrote a treatment and they approved that. And then they asked us to write the screenplay, which we did. And, you know, there was the usual back and forth, but not very much. And then it, it was uh, greenlit. Gary Kurtz, uh, producer of Star Wars, was uh, producing. Uh, and that gave them some uh, uh, security blanket feeling. And we would be shooting in the UK, in London, at Elstree Studios, where Star Wars and Indiana, you know, it, 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 anything that made them feel more comfortable about hiring a sound designer editor to make this multi-million dollar film uh, all of those things helped to get the film uh, to the to the point that we started shooting. And you clearly decided on a different approach. I mean, I see it not so much as a sequel, but a kind of alternative universe kind of version of The Wizard of Oz. Is there ever a suggestion from Disney about it being a musical? No. No? No, that the musical, especially in the early, late 70s, early 80s, had... There, there had been a number of failures of mu big musicals, and you know the, what it takes to for a industry to do musicals is a whole infrastructure of sensibilities that the '60s had kind of pushed that away, mm. and so I I wasn't confident, you know I'd ne never directed a feature film before, and I wasn't confident about directing a musical film. But the other thing to remember is that there's the 1939 film uh, with uh, all of the, the kind of vaudevillian qualities of that uh, era. 
Uh, and then there were the books, and those are two separate universes. So what I wanted to do would, was to make a film like the, the books, in a sense, to, to make Oz as if we were making The Black Stallion, uh, to base it in reality. This is a real shipwreck. This is a real island uh, mm. rather than painted sets. And uh, so that, that was... Uh, the decision and the, the, there was no can't you do this can't you do that kind of thing they were nervous about the whole opening that we had written uh, with the electrotherapy stuff mm. but they thought well if we're gonna hire people from outside Disney we don't we want to give them the, their ability to do what they want so there, there was a brief period there where that sensibility was allowed to, to run free, so to speak. Mm. And that electrotherapy part of the, the story, I guess, came from the research you would have done, you know, about the turn of the century and this new kind of world that was evolving. So it kind of positions that film in its time and gives it a reality beyond uh, what the original film did, I guess. Yeah, no, very much. The, there was a lot of that stuff going on in 1900, uh, which is when the film is set, just right, right around Halloween of 1899. And uh, yeah, we, that, that whole Dr. Worley is a real, was a real person. Uh, he was based on one of these people. And it, it, I should mention that electrotherapy is not electroshock therapy. They, uh, and in fact, we're coming now back around to that kind of thinking about how the brain works. And, you know, they, it was early days in understanding that the brain had electricity in it. And so what they thought was that when you're confused, like Dorothy is, uh, it's because you're neurons are tangled like like hair and so what we're going to do is kind of run a comb through the tangles and smooth everything out that was the the concept behind it mm. i think a lot of people kind of misremember that original movie as well you know that i think even when i became a parent and my kids got to the age of four or five i thought oh, yeah, i'll show them wizard of oz and i just gave it a quick watch and i <laughs> thought wow this is actually a lot darker than i remember i think a lot of people remember you know the skipping down the yellow brick road and the dog and yeah. the dress and the ruby slippers but actually there's a lot of darkness in in that movie so right. what do you think it is that people have kind of misunderstood about about your movie because although it kind of immediately subverts the i guess the iconography of oz um yeah it's not that much darker than the original movie. I maybe it is something to do with that setting, as you said before, um, where yours is based in more of a reality. You know, I, I think it's also that it isn't a musical. Yeah, but sure. In a yeah. film that has, you know, there, there's that uh, little uh, scene description of the film where it says, "Girl arrives in surreal landscape, uh, kills somebody, and then." forms an alliance with three strangers to kill again. So that's, that's the Wizard of Oz. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I, I remember talking to uh, Maurice Sendak, who at one point was going to do the production design mm. uh, on Return to Oz. And he said he was, whatever he was, eight years old when, uh, when he saw the Wizard of Oz, and it completely terrified him. Mm -hmm. It was one of the foundational experiences of his life was watching how scary the, the Wizard of Oz was in 1939 when it was made. Uh, but it's relieved by the music. If You can have these scary things, but then when people start singing, what you're saying is, it's just, it's not real. It, it's, this is just a premise to entertain you. Whereas I, I think... Uh, well, first of all, I should say that I, I wanted the film to be scary like fairy tales are scary. Yeah. Um, so I was very surprised when people were really frightened by the film because there's no blood. Nobody touches anybody to do them harm. I mean, hands come out to threaten you, but there's no, 
you know, the, the closest anyone comes to real peril is Jack Pumpkinhead being swallowed by the Gnome King. Yeah. Which is, you know. Uh, the other thing, I think, which is big is that uh, in The Wizard of Oz, Dorothy was Judy Garland, who was 16. And in Return to Oz, Feruza Balk was nine, which is the real age that Dorothy was, because I wanted to make it like the book. And seeing a nine-year-old in danger is different than seeing a 16-year-old playing a nine-year-old, which is obviously fantasy. Mm. Uh, but the real nine-year-old, you think, well, what's going to happen? If, especially if you're a, an eight-year-old watching this. Uh, so I think there's, there's that element. Um, She's very convincing as well, Feruza book. I mean, she... Absolutely. She, yeah. you, you, you're right with her because you, you can feel like her sort of depression in the beginning and her desperation to kind of prove that she did have this experience. And then throughout the film, you know, you shoot these wonderful reactions of her um, kind of experiencing the world around her. And I think that separates it from the Judy Garland experience where at any moment, as you say, it's a bit kind of, oh, golly, kind of, aren't we having a gay old time? Let's sing right. a song. That never right. happens. Yeah. And for much of the film, she's the only human being on screen. This is true. Yeah. You know, she's surrounded by claymation and puppets, mm -hmm. TikTok and Jack and Belina and Dorothy. Whereas in the Judy Garland film, she's got Ray Bolger and Bert Lahr, you know, uh, their other grown-ups are friendly with her, whereas Dorothy is alone with uh, creatures. Mm. Um, but it's a, she's a fantastic actress. Uh, there, there was, I, I, I would say, after a day of shooting, driving back home, I would say, she's not a child, she's a grown-up from the land of children. <laughs> Meaning her, her absolute command of what it takes to act in a film, and, you know, obviously being able to memorize all the dialogue and not making any mistakes and knowing where to look for the camera and... Oh, uh, Feruza, we're going to do a pickup shot from two weeks ago when you're talking to TikTok. Oh, yeah. Um, and she knew exactly where, to, where she was looking two weeks earlier, <laughs> even though we were not shooting it with TikTok now. <laughs> so, uh, and, and that was repeated over and over again. And in between takes, she would disappear. And I'd say, Feruza, where are you? I'm up here. And she'd climbed up the scaffolding at, <laughs> on the set, you know, the, the lighting scaffold, and was talking to the, the, the lighting guys up, <laughs> way up top, you know. And she treated the whole experience like a playground, like a vast jungle gym. And that was true from the moment we started uh, preliminary tests with, with her. And she was just very, very comfortable in that environment with, it, with everybody. And that told me it's going to be tough, but she will survive this experience. Yeah, I, I, I watched um, this morning, uh, found the, the making of the little half an hour kind of, you know, it's semi-promotional, -pro -pro of course. Right. Um, but it has some, some little inserts of interviews with her. And she does come across as a very, very confident kid, very kind of savvy. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, timing is clearly an important part of a film's success and, and how it fits into the culture of the time. If I look back to 1985, there was, I guess, the two big successes in terms of family movies back then were Back to the Future and The Goonies. Right. Now, both contain right. violence, guns, kidnap, terrorists. Right. <laughs> so so yeah. what is it about um, Return to Oz that made it more scary to kids and unacceptable to parents? Do you think it, I mean, we kind of cover this, I guess, but... Do you think it's something to do with that rose-tinted memory of the original and parents going, oh, I, I'll, I had a wonderful time seeing it when I was a kid. I'll take my kids to see this sequel. Yeah. And then their expectations were, were kind of dashed. Yeah, it, it, Wizard of Oz would play every Easter. Mm. 
okay, it's going to play again. Let's all watch The Wizard of Oz. So it was like a member of the family. Mm. And so even though it had scary things in it, they were not scary anymore because of the repeated viewings. It turns out all right in the end. Whereas when you watch Return to Oz and for the first time, you don't know how it's going to end. And so it is scary. And it has no, there are no musical numbers. There's music, but no singing. Uh, another thing I think that put parents on ill at ease about the film is that uh, Aunt M abandons Dorothy at the clinic. Mm. And there's a movie convention, especially among where parents are pictured, especially the mother figure who, you know, you, in that version of the film, Aunt Em would be walking away from the building and then she'd stop and she'd say, there's something funny about that place. I don't know what it is, but, and so she'd go back, mm. but she doesn't. She, it, it's real in that sense. Uh, she leaves and Dorothy is there. Uh, and so the film says to kids, it says, you know, sometimes your parents, although they're meaning well, will put you in a dangerous situation. So you've got to look out for yourself and form mm. friendships, unlikely friendships with whoever you can grab, you know, the the Ozmas and the TikToks and the Jack Pumpkinheads and the Bolinas uh, to help you. And so that's a, a kind of an undercurrent message uh, that's present in the Oz books. Uh, you know, the, the Oz books, Aunt Em and Uncle Henry are, are not the Uncle, Aunt Em and Hunk, Uncle Henry of the 1939 movie. So th that's another element, I think, that goes on. Yeah, I wonder if one day it will be rediscovered as a kind of feminist film in a way, because you've got this strong female protagonist that's you know kind of doing it on her own. All right, she's being assisted by her friends, but she's uh, certainly got a, a good head on her shoulders and isn't relying on any man to come and rescue her. Yeah, I mean another element is that uh, films for kids that star people like Dorothy uh, are not immediate magnets for kids to go and see. The Quaron's film, The Little Princess, suffered the same fate mm. uh, because girls will go see it, but boys won't go see it because it's a girl film. Whereas if it was The Goonies, it was a bunch of boys, the boys will go see it and the girls will go along with the boys to see it because they go along. Mm -hmm. So that's another, that, that's another element uh, there in the, in the film's reception. Yeah, I think that's part of Western culture, isn't it? Because if you look at like yeah. the films of Miyazaki and Studio Ghibli, I mean, there are right. so many girls in those films and they, they're hugely, hugely popular um, by my, my girls and my family as well. Um, yeah. I have to be honest here and say that I saw the film in 1980 six I think it would have been and it and it did scare me and my sister right. and I watched it again for the second time last night <laughs> 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 and actually I was kind of I'd seen bits of it over the years when it was on tv and I was actually quite surprised at how visually stunning it is yeah I mean you know was it Salisbury you shot in I think wasn't it and there's some stunning landscapes and then look at some of the sets that you had at Elstree there like the kind of right. mirrored palace and everything um some wonderful atmospheric stuff there. What What are you most proud of about the film? I I can't slice and dice it. You know. Yeah, are you, you are you are proud of the film, though. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Mm. I mean, a, a thing it it went through three successive Disney uh, executive mm. boards. It was started by one group. They were replaced just before we started shooting. We shot with that group and then they were replaced when the film was in late post-production. So by the time the film was being promoted, it was two generations old as far as studio executives were concerned. Mm. And, you know, they didn't promote it correctly. 
Uh, it was a difficult film to promote because of everything we've been talking about. You, you had to figure out how to pitch it, uh, and they didn't. Uh, but they didn't care about the film because oh, that's old stuff. And so they actually let me alone pretty much in, in the post-production of the film. They, they didn't come and say, do this, do this, do this. Uh, because they'd already kind of they'd already written the film off in a sense. Mm-hmm. And if you if you now had the chance to kind of go back and and recut, do you think there was anything that you left out or anything that you included that you would have taken out? Um, mm. No, not not no. not fundamentally. There there at the time of this first shift that I was talking about, the a, cult, a new executive came in as head of Disney. And they, they basically said, what is this film? Uh, and uh, they decided the budget, we can't make this film for that much money. So they, uh, we had to cut a lot before shooting. And Gary Kurtz was fired, although not on paper. He was promoted to executives, poobah, whatever. Mm-hmm. But he basically had very little to do with the film from that point on during shooting and in post-production. Uh, and they appointed Paul Maslansky, uh, who was not a producer so much as he was an executive watching out for the studio's interest on the right. film. But so I didn't have... Uh, there was no really powerful person on my side uh, in the making of the film because Gary was not around and Paul was not that person. Mm. Uh, I remember we, when, he, when he arrived in London, we invited him over for dinner at our house. And, you know, it was a nice dinner and we talked about jazz. He was a jazz aficionado. Uh, and he said... Um, I'm not going to have dinner with you again because I don't want to be your friend on this film. Um, that's not, you know, that's not my role on this film. So you think, okay, what's this going to be like? <laughs> and it was rough because of that. You know. But we did. I did rewrite the script and I cut out about 15 pages. Um, and there was a whole other bunch of characters called the Army of Oz, which was in the book. Uh, And they were six generals and one soldier. And the soldier was TikTok. So I I made the decision to amputate that arm. It, It, I think, would have been interesting to have them in the film. It, It would have relieved, it would have been some adult presence around Dorothy, even mm. though they were pictured as incompetence. Wilfred Bramble was going to be one of them, you know, from, uh, uh, and, you know, we were going to have fun with them. Uh, but it, it just was one of those decisions that it got made. I made it. Uh, and it allowed the film to get made because it really significantly cut the the time and the, the budget of the film. And when you were kind of going through those difficulties, and I think you said before, briefly fired for a moment or two there, did you go and seek the counsel of George and Francis and your other contemporaries? Yeah, yeah they, uh, George flew over. When I was fired, George flew over from Japan. He was having a conference with Kurosawa about something. And at his own, at his own expense, flew to London and convinced Richard Berger, who was the executive who fired me, to rehire me uh, because uh, nobody was going to take this film on. By firing Walter, you have essentially killed the film. And he uh, became a sponsor of the film. uh, And he said, everything will be fine from now on, but if it isn't, I will step in and do something. Hmm. And at that, to have George Lucas say that 
made them all calm down. And I was, I spent six days in outer Mongolia, uh, having been fired, and then I came back. The film never stopped shooting. Uh, we, I was talking to Mike Kitchens, who was an associate producer, and he and the uh, A camera man were kept things ticking over. Um, in, in case I was rehired, um, and which in fact did happen. I was, um, I was of course looking up um, some things about the reviews at the time as well, and there was that famous Siskel and Ebert um, kind of, you know, segment where they tore the film to pieces. Um, right. You know, and they talk about how this is not an upbeat kids' film, and then you think the original, right. you know, she's in a tornado, she can't get home, she kills a witch. Um, right. And the positive things about that film are, are the relationships with the other characters in the same way that it is in your film. And I wondered, I was talking to my wife, I wondered if given today's kind of landscape of, you know, how film news breaks with Twitter and Facebook and social media, I wonder if the film today would have found its audience um, rather because, because then you were relying on word of mouth a lot more right. from you know, obviously you have these key figures, Siskel and Ebert, and then that kind of proliferates across the the industry. Right. Um, yeah, not necessarily a question for you, Walter, but I just wondered, it feels like maybe it was a, a film that people weren't quite ready for at the time. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, all you have to do is, you know, s speed ahead 10 years to Nightmare Before Christmas, you mm. know, which has a Jack Pumpkinhead character in it. And all of Tim Burton's sensibility is is kind of, you can sort of see the a continuity there, but in 1985, that hadn't hit mm -hmm. yet. Yeah, I was thinking about Coraline. Yeah, Henry Selleck was Henry Selleck, the director of that, was one of the storyboard artists in development on Return to Oz. Oh, really? Yeah, interesting guy, Selleck. Yeah. Um, so, how were you perceived by Hollywood after the reaction of Return to Oz, and how did that inform your next project? Uh, well, it, it, in, in three words, probably, how dare he <laughs> make a sequel to The Wizard of Oz and make it like this? Mm. Uh, people probably felt the idea of making a sequel was a bad idea in the first place. And then to make one that scares children who <laughs> run screaming out of the theater is, it's like, you know, I, I had committed a crime, so mm -hmm. I was banished. And, uh, I, you know, I had a number of other uh, directing projects that I wanted to take on, and nothing ever happened. You know, it was, it, it's, you know, whether the term for that is you go to jail, Hollywood jail, and that's where I was. And so I couldn't stay in jail, really, because I had a family to support, so I went back to editing. Mm. And what was the next project? Do you remember? Unbearable likeness of being. So that was what eighty-eight, yeah. Well, eighty-eight release. Yeah, yeah. we started. Yeah. It, yeah, it came out in early eighty-eight, but we started filming in eighty-six. Mm. And you've directed a couple of other things since then, but not features. I mean, there was the Clone Wars episode. There was the Captain EO stuff that you did. What, what, what lessons learned on Oz did you bring to those, do you think? Uh, well, I, I, I directed a, a, a musical number for Captain EO, a, a second unit, with Michael Jackson. Um, I, one of the two people on Earth who directed Michael Jackson in a 3D 70 millimeter movie, Francis Coppola being the other. Um, and uh, yes, I did a, a Clone Wars episode just to keep things ticking over, I was in between projects and George Lucas said, why don't you do this? It might be interesting. And uh, it's a you know, half hour animated uh, episode of this ongoing series, The Clone Wars. Uh, so that was fascinating because, you know, d directing animation, especially for somebody who'd never done it before, is a big learning experience. And they were also breaking in new developmental software on that, which is a, 
a kind of uh, training wheels version of Maya. Um, and I was given it and told, go ahead, do something. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, I blocked out some scenes in it and then set the locations and here are the characters and they're doing this. And this is the camera is here. No, it's over here and that, that kind of stuff. So it, it's such a different animal that uh, from directing actors on sets in live action that I, I wouldn't want to compare it. You know, you just use your cinematic sensibility of, you know, uh, when do you want to sh use a wide shot? When do you want to do a close up? Whose point of view is this? Uh, what would make the greatest impact here? Do people understand the story here? You know, all that kind of stuff. Hmm. And can you, are you able to talk briefly about any of the other projects, directing projects that you wanted to get off the ground or are they kind of buried in Hollywood history? <laughs> they're, they're history. One of them was a, a kind of serious mummy movie set in Egypt um, about an archaeologist who goes off the deep end and believes that he is the reincarnation of the person. You know, is he really or is it schizophrenia? That, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other project was a, a sort of a twin biography of Nikola Tesla and Thomas Edison, mm. and a sort of Mozart Salieri, but yep. inverted. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, those were the two projects that I had on the boil. Yeah, that's the thing with Hollywood, isn't it? There's so many projects that kind of disappear for whatever reason. Um, and it's just a shame that the circumstances of Return to Waza kind of happened and, and prevented you from doing that. But I think, you know, I think you've used that sort of cooking analogy in your books before about in your book before about sound design, where it's best to use fresh ingredients and all that kind of stuff. Right. And I think Oz does appear to have all of the ingredients, the right ingredients, you know, for, for a great family movie. It's as if the... I don't know, the oven wasn't working or something. Um, the oven being the, the sort of zeitgeist of the time. People just weren't ready for it, maybe. Yeah, and I, an, an element in there is, um, well, there's, there's two things. It's worth remembering uh, that despite my love for the Oz, project, the Oz books, they were banned from libraries in America because it was about witches and wizards, and therefore it was unchristian. Um, and so the, there was a lot of middle America against the Oz books, not so much the movie. Mm. The movie somehow got under the radar, although it was not a big success when it first came out. It, it success only happened is that right? after it started running on television and people got familiar with it. Uh, so there, there was, and that's still there, you know, that's, uh, that kind of sensibility is metastasized into Trumpism now, but it's present. Um, and if the executives who greenlit Return to Oz had stayed in power and had given the film the correct launch, kind of w warning people about what kind of movie it was, mm. but you're going to love it. Because <laughs> mm. uh, uh, I was making the film not only for kids, but for kids, for grown-ups who had grown up on The Wizard of Oz and you know, who might be interested in seeing this other, as you put it, this other planet in the Oz solar system. Um, so, but that didn't happen. You know, the, the executives, uh, Eisner and Katzenberg, were two generations removed and their ad campaign basically said, avoid this movie. So, mm. I did see um, one TV spot 
um, on YouTube that was like, it was all very jolly, like, here's TikTok, he's a mechanical man. And right. it was all a bit yeah. kind of jolly, which is not the tone of the film that I'd, no, I'd just I watched. Think, uh, you know, the, the original uh, executives had asked Drew Struzan to do a poster, and he did that mm. great poster of uh, turn of the century women heads featuring Bombay. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that says, you know, something. That, that's a more accurate picture of what the movie is going to be than what, what wound up being. Yeah, I was trying to find out what other territories it may have been received differently in. And I know that it had some success in other territories. And I read that one, one place in particular, Japan, it was Japan. fairly well received. Yeah. But then again, it goes back to what we were talking about. People were ready for a, a female protagonist yeah. and that kind of visual imagination that the film had. Yeah. 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 Also, uh, Latin America, Spain. Mm. Um, no, I think it had its roughest uh, market in the United States because of the, the fact that the Wizard of Oz film is not just a film, it's a, um, it's a standard by which Americans sort of judge themselves. And many quotes from it are just part of ordinary language. Toto, I think we're not in Kansas anymore, or there's no place like home. Or, those lines are just, you know, part of uh, normal conversations. So it, it's, uh, it was risky. I mean, I knew it was risky to begin with, but it, it became even riskier because of the cultural shift. And also, I, I think, ironically, if it had come out in the 1970s or the 1990s, it would have, but the 80s was morning in America. It was white bread America. It was Ronald Reagan. It was banish the darkness. It was... Mm -hmm. you know, except for certain kinds of darkness. Mm. Uh, um, but that, that, that's another factor in it, is that the, 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 the zeitgeist had shifted by 1986 to uh, a kind of Reagan America that is not so tolerant of these things. Mm. Yeah, appreciate your time, really do. It's been a pleasure. Okay, All right. thanks. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I hope you enjoyed this bonus episode. Next up is Oscar-winning sound designer Gary Rydstrom and Oscar-winning writer and director John Patrick Shanley. Thanks to the new patrons on Patreon. If you can also contribute um, and help me continue to make this podcast, please do so at patreon.com forward slash Jamie Benning. Thanks for joining me, and I hope you can do so again for the next episode of the Film Mentories podcast. to stone. You will be rather attractive. One day. Not at all beautiful, you understand, but you'll have a certain prettiness. Different from my other heads. I believe I'll lock you in the tower for a few years till your head is ready. And then I'll take it. I believe you will...